Hello there. Welcome to the Potter's Wheel. Thanks for tuning in. I'm George Osmus. I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Church, I'm sure you've noticed by now that life in this world is full of uncertainty. We never know what a day will bring, joy or sadness, triumph or tragedy. In fact, this world is so chaotic that it can even be hard to tell the difference. What seems like the worst day of your life can turn out to be your biggest blessing. And what seems to be the luckiest break can turn around and unleash the fury of hell into your life. Now, the topic of suffering isn't a popular one, but I believe it's one the church needs to address. As the people of God, we need to reach a level of maturity in this area so that we're not shaken uh, when it comes our way. We don't want to be counted among those that Jesus said would stumble and faint under the heat of suffering and persecution. We'll be talking about all that and more on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work. Chief among them is the potter's wheel. Church, forgive me for stating the obvious, but we live in a fallen world that really is under the sway of the wicked one. That is not a negative confession. That is an accurate assessment of the world's current condition, and it comes directly from the pages of Scripture. But that's not the full story, is it? Scripture also tells us that there's a light in the darkness, a God who so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Praise God. We look at Jacob's son Joseph, he of the coat of many colors, as an example of God's ability to take what the enemy means for evil and turn it for our good. Even Jesus acknowledged the condition of the world and the hope he was bringing with him when he said, In the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Paul told the Romans that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Today we're going to take a look at a clip that might cause you to question Paul's wisdom. Imagine seeing your parents, your neighbors, your entire village slaughtered before your eyes. Imagine being kidnapped and forced into slavery and enduring years of hard labor. And when you're finally released, you find yourself thrown into a literal fight to the death cage match. How could anything good come out of such a bleak existence? Well, that's just the situation that a certain young barbarian named Conan found himself in. Today, we're revisiting John Milius' Conan the Barbarian from 1982, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. This clip comes from the beginning of the movie and tells the story of Conan as a child. Left an orphan following an enemy attack on his village, young Conan is bound to the wheel of pain and put to forced labor. His prospects are pretty bleak, as you can see for yourself.
Let's take a moment to interpret the symbols from the clip. Conan represents the believer, obviously. The Wheel of Pain represents the trials, the struggles, and the persecution that we endure as followers of Jesus. The guards at the wheel represent the demonic spirits assigned to torment us, harass us, and if possible, deceive us into renouncing our faith in the Lord. If you don't know the story of Conan, you might be wondering what good could possibly come from so bleak an existence, especially when you consider that his freedom from the wheel only resulted in him being conscripted into life or death gladiatorial combat. What you have to realize is that Conan's years of brutal, hard labor actually worked to give him the phenomenal strength that he needed as a gladiator. His skill and prowess as a gladiator eventually let him win his freedom, and that freedom led him to fulfill his destiny and avenge his people. Just as Conan's hard life equipped him for his later mission, so the trials and tribulations that we face as the children of God can be used to give us the tools that we need to fulfill the call of God on our lives. We all go through periods where we are tied to our own version of the wheel of pain. It's different for everybody. For one, it might be an addiction that has to be overcome. For another, it might be a severe health crisis. It can take many forms, but whatever version of the wheel of pain is operating in your life, it can be hard to believe Paul's promise that all things work together for good. I understand the temptation to give in to depression and hopelessness when your life is the monotony of pushing that wheel. But we are called to a life of faith, not unbelief. We will not be like the Israelites, marching aimlessly and endlessly around the desert until we die, never to see the promised land. We are called to believe, and by that belief, to overcome. Part of the secret to overcoming is to refuse to judge our life by our outward circumstances. One of the devil's tactics is to get you to buy into the lie that the struggle will never end, that your life will always be dominated by the pain of that moment. If you buy into that lie, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I want you to realize, church, that everything about this life is fleeting and temporary. Nothing lasts forever, not joy, not sorrow, not pleasure, not pain. This too shall pass, they say, and for once, they are right. The first thing you have to let go of in order to survive your wheel of pain is the idea that the goal of life is your own personal happiness. It's not. I know we think it is. We built a whole new gospel to support that idea. But the truth is, guys, we're not going to be judged on how happy our life was. We're going to be judged on how well or how poorly we fulfilled the call of God on our lives. Our drive for personal happiness can actually get in the way of the real goal, living to please our Heavenly Father. It has been said that happiness depends on our circumstances being judged as good or bad, but inner peace does not. Wrapped up in this is the idea that we, in our carnal, unrenewed minds, and our selfish, sinful arrogance, think that we are wise enough to discern good and evil on our own, apart from God. This goes back to the garden. It was the cause of the fall. Deceived by Satan, the first humans chose to independently decide for themselves to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to disobey God and obey the enemy. See, it's always one or the other, church. There is no middle ground. We're always saying yes to one and no to the other. Until Jesus is actually Lord over our lives, most of the time we're going to be seeing, saying yes to the wrong one. It's very hard to know, apart from the Word and the Spirit of God, what is good and what is bad. Did you know that? Part of the reason for that, I guess, is that we like being the ones in charge. We like being the judge of all things in our life because we think that gives us control. But the truth is, it's all an illusion. You don't have control over anything, and neither do I. Let me tell you a story of three people on an average morning just like any other. The sun comes up, and they're getting ready to start their day. The first one gets out of the shower and suddenly realizes that he's sweating profusely. He's a little dizzy and nauseated, and, well, the next thing he knows, he's hovering over the toilet bowl rehashing last night's supper. He's nailed with the flu or food poisoning or something like it. This is a bad day, isn't it? His neighbor down the street has gotten ready for work and gone into her garage, and as she's fishing her car keys out, she notices that her tires are flat. She looks closer and sees that someone has slashed them. Well, who's having a worse day, her or the first guy? But wait, there's more. 
The third guy has made it out of the neighborhood and is on his way to work, but suddenly he finds himself in gridlock. The freeway has turned into a parking lot and there's no way he's gonna make that nine o'clock meeting now. He's gonna blow the big sales pitch and probably lose that promotion he's up for. This is a bad day, right? Then flight 11 strikes the North Tower. That bad day these people were experiencing has just saved their lives. The point I'm trying to make, church, is that we don't know where all the things that we encounter in our lives are ultimately going to take us. But I can tell you that if you will dethrone yourself, if you will begin to refuse to judge circumstances as good or bad apart from God, you will begin freeing up your soul to experience the peace of God on a new level. When you know that all things work together for good for you because you love God and you are one of the called, then you no longer have to worry about whether or not this is good or bad because you know that ultimately it's all going to work together for good for you if you will continue to love God in it. Suffering isn't a very popular topic. It doesn't fill the pews on a Sunday morning and get people to tune into your television program. In fact, if you're still watching, thank you for sticking with me. But the fact is, suffering is part of the reality of this fallen world, and as the people of God, we had best learn how to endure it. If you have bought into the bill of goods that life is going to be all sunshine and rainbows after you accept Jesus as your Savior... The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. I'm sorry about your doctrine, but I do love you enough to want to equip you to win the battles that nobody told you you were going to fight. Here's some of what Jesus actually promised to his disciples if they would continue to follow him. You will be delivered up to councils. You will be scourged in the synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings. And he meant as criminals, not honored guests. Brother will de deliver brother up to death and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Persecution is part of the promises of God for our lives, folks. Jesus said if they persecuted him, they will persecute us. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. There is a different spirit operating in us than that which is in the world. John said it this way, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. The spirit of unbelief and rebellion that drives those still in the world hates the spirit of faith and obedience that lives in us. The people who are under the control of that spirit probably don't recognize the source of their hatred of the people of God. They think it's all about our political and religious and social beliefs. But really, it's a spiritual issue. In the parable of the sower, Jesus taught that those who receive the seed on stony ground have no root in themselves and endure only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. If you hope to be able to endure the persecution that comes on all genuine followers of Jesus, you need to get rid of the stony places, the hard places of rebellion, the hard places where you insist on having your own way, the hard places where you resist the call of God, the hard places where you hang on to the sin that Jesus has called you to put down. The book of Acts is filled with real life first century accounts of the persecution suffered by the first church. In chapters 3 and 4, Peter and John were arrested for healing a lame man. In chapter 7, Stephen was stoned after preaching to the Sanhedrin. In chapter 14, Paul, who incidentally had consented to the stoning of Stephen, was himself stoned and left for dead. That same level of persecution is still going on today in other parts of the world. In places like Afghanistan and North Korea, our brothers and sisters are robbed, beaten, raped, jailed, even publicly executed for their witness of Jesus Christ. Yet in those countries, the power of God is being poured out and the church of Jesus Christ is on the move. When the U.S. left Afghanistan, I heard testimonies of Afghani men who sent their wives and children off to safety while they stayed behind to try to win some of their countrymen. They knew sticking around was going to cost them their lives, but they were so full of the Spirit of God, so full of the love of God, that they literally loved not their lives unto the death and were willing to lay down their mortal bodies just for the chance to save a neighbor. A neighbor, by the way, who wanted to kill them. 
Shoo, buddy. If you're not impressed by that, you really do need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Persecution isn't just a problem for those in third world nations or on the other side of the planet. It's happening right here at home, too. Those who have chosen to oppose the kingdom of God are beginning to weaponize government institutions to hinder or silence the church. Not that long ago, Congress heard testimony from numerous Christian and conservative groups about the deliberate targeting in their organizations by the IRS. Christian business owners who support the biblical definition of marriage are targeted by the ungodly and perpetually hauled into court if they don't go along with their perversions. Social media outlets will gleefully shut down your account if you say things that they don't like. And if they don't shut you down, you run the risk of inciting the rage of the demonized political leftists. The venom that comes out on these social media platforms, all in the name of acceptance and tolerance, mind you, is often too much for me to stomach. It leaves me wondering how much longer a culture as divided as ours can continue to endure. Even though we live in a fallen world, it's not all gloom, doom, and woe for the people of God. Quite the opposite, in fact. We're going to pause for a brief word from Potter's Will Films, and when we come back, we're going to talk about how God turns what the enemy meant for evil for good. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you think a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Will Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies that preach the gospel, demonstrate biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with your digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to put our tools and talent to work for you to expand your audience and increase your ministry's impact on the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email at potterswheelfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. Welcome back. We've talked a lot about Paul's comment in Romans 8, 28, where he says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. One thing that kind of gets glossed over in the discussion of this verse is that good is always defined from God's perspective. As we all know by now, what our flesh calls good and what God calls good are two very different things. In Acts 16, Paul casts a spirit of divination out of a young slave girl. He and Silas are promptly arrested, tried, beaten, and thrown into prison, proving that even in the first century, no good deed goes unpunished. Paul and Silas' response to their arrest shows us that they have progressed beyond allowing their souls to be ruled by their outward circumstances. They spent the night in jail praying and singing hymns to God. Can you agree with me that their eyes were on something other than their chains? What happened? Well, hallelujah, there's a great earthquake. The doors are opened and everyone's chains are loosed. The keeper of the prison winds up getting born again, which obviously God calls good. We talked earlier about how Jesus told us we would be hauled before councils and before governors and kings. While our flesh says that it's not good that we're on trial, God calls it good that we, uh, that we get to witness to these people. We get to share the gospel, which gives His Spirit the opportunity to work on their hearts. We're planting seed, church, or we're watering seed that someone else already planted. Who can know when God will provide the increase? We talked about Joseph and the rough path he had getting into Pharaoh's cabinet. He definitely endured some things that his flesh would not call good, but the end of it was that God used him to save two nations from a worldwide famine. God calls that good. Can I get a witness that being beat to a bloody pulp and nailed to a cross is not a good thing? But Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Who can deny that the good that came from the suffering Jesus endured on the cross on our behalf? Paul put it this way, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The bad things Jesus endured resulted in a very good thing for those of us who believe and follow Him. 
We've got to get our mind right on the subject of suffering, church. None of us are exempt from it. We're all going to experience it to one degree or another and in a variety of ways. Some suffering we're going to bring on ourselves as a result of the poor choices we make for our lives. Some suffering is going to be forced on us by the poor choices of others. Some suffering we're going to choose to experience as we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. Some suffering we're going to experience because of the stands that we take for righteousness in this fallen world. But by the Spirit of God, we can get to the place where we say with Paul, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, and where we recognize that our light affliction, which is for but a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Jesus said that we are blessed when people revile and persecute us and say all kinds of evil against us falsely for his name's sake. His counsel to us in that situation is to rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. At the end of the day, church, we need to really get that we are just passing through this world. It really is as close to hell as we're ever going to get. We are citizens of a greater kingdom, a perfect kingdom that is not of this world. Jesus said he was going away to prepare a place for us and promised that he would come again to receive us to himself. The Bible gives us glimpses of the kingdom that is to come. I would encourage you to seek these out and take them to heart. We're going through a very tough time in history. More and more people are getting confused and calling evil good and good evil. Those of us who still use the Word of God as our moral compass find ourselves on the receiving end of vicious attacks and vile accusations from those who have rejected God's authority over their lives. Things are heating up all over the world, but the promises of God are still in effect and they are yes and amen in Jesus. Those promises are not just for the kingdom to come, but also for this world. Listen to what he says to the faithful in Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, and those who wait on the Lord, that's us, shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Thank you, Lord. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. That's us, church. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Our time is almost up, so before we close in prayer, let me offer you a final word of encouragement. Church, we have been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken, the true kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When the kingdoms of this world get shaken, as they are right now, we can take refuge in the secret place of the Most High. The more we divorce our souls, our mind, will, and emotions from the circumstances and the material things of this world, the less shaken we will be when world-shaking events like the pandemic, war, and economic collapse come around. Hold fast to what is good, church, your covenant relationship with God through Christ. Don't let anyone 
man or beast, angel or demon, cheat you out of what you have in Christ. Remember, this too shall pass. So don't let some temporary condition trick you into denying Jesus. While you are trudging through your trials, pushing your own personal wheel of pain, rejoice that the Lord works all things together for your good and that the pain you endure today will work in you a strength for tomorrow that will surely help you fulfill the call of God on your life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the more sure word of prophecy that you have given us, your written word. We thank you for your faithfulness and that we know that what you have spoken, you will bring to pass and what you have promised, you will perform. Help each of us, Father, to stop trying to judge our circumstances as good or bad and simply trust you with our lives. We trust you, Father, to take what the enemy meant for evil and make all things work together for good toward us because we love you and we are the called according to your purpose. Thank you, Lord, for your promise not to test us beyond what we are able, but with the testing you make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Thank you for the promise of your coming kingdom, where there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, where there shall be no more pain and no more wickedness, for all evil will have passed away. Help us, Lord, to fulfill your call in our lives in the days that remain before you come again. Help us to lift up your name that you might draw all men to yourself. Empower us to be your witnesses and to share the good news with everyone who has ears to hear it. In Jesus' name, God bless.